Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 66 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the podcast. The Knife Junkie Podcast is the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn all about knives and knife collecting and hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, anyone who loves knives. If that's you, you're in the right place. And Bob, another good show today. Uh, Who are you speaking with on this episode of the podcast? This week I speak with Brian Nadeau of Sharp by Design. He has been making knives in his garage on his own CNC machine for uh, about six years, something like that, seven years. And he has uh, taken the, the knife world by storm with these extremely intricate and beautifully produced and designed handmade handmade slash machine-made knives. But uh, he recently uh, takes the cake for me, takes takes the title as most beautiful folding knife just mm. to, to my eye, and that is his arch nemesis design. It's a recent, uh, he's just finishing up a run on uh, these arch nemeses and they are uh, double-edged folding daggers on bearings and the and and his special detent the whole nine yards uh but double-edged and perfectly symmetrical uh but still fitting into uh, a regular out the side regular folding handle so Mm -hmm. they're amazing looking well and that you know that just kind of slipped by there in conversation would you say the (laughs) most beautiful yeah i said to my eye it is the most beautiful folding knife out there it's just perfect it's it's uh i i compare it to the vitruvian man that you know da vinci drawing diagram with a man standing there with his arms outstretched in a network of circles and squares kind of showing all the perfect proportions of the human body it's kind of the same thing i look at that knife i'm like it's just perfect wow high praise from yeah, the knife yeah. junkie <laughs> and that's not even a hint to my wife if she's listening because it's <laughs> it's a it's a costly knife <laughs> All right, we're going to get into that interview, but first I want to uh, let you know about uh, one of our sponsors for the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you are in the knife business or want to get in the knife business, you've got to have an online uh, store. You've got to have an online presence, and what better way to start building your online store than to jump right in? But, you know, maybe you're not good at web development or design, or you hate installing and updating e-commerce plugins or popular website builders that aren't really made for online stores. Maybe you're looking for a way to get more e-commerce tools built in and connected to your website. After all, with better tools at your fingertips, the more efficient your business can become and the more profits you can make. That's why it's a smart decision to use a dedicated e-commerce platform for your online store. Of course, picking the right software can always be a hassle with a lot of second guessing. You're trying to determine which platform is best for you. That's why we're glad that we can offer Knife Junkie listeners a 15-day free trial of 3D Cart with no credit card required. You can use this time to create your website with easy-to-use, customizable online store builder, get a taste of the inventory management features, decide which plan your business needs are, and more. With a risk-free trial, you can get hands-on experience with the most feature-rich e-commerce website builder there is, and find out how easy it is to get started creating the perfect online store for your knife business. So go to thenifejunkie.com slash 3D trial. That's thenifejunkie.com slash 3D trial. That's the number three and the letter D, 3D trial. Let's get into that interview with Brian Nadeau next. Do you carry multiple knives, then overthink which one to use when an actual cutting chore pops up? You're a knife junkie of the first order. I'm speaking with Brian Nadeau of Sharp by Design. You know him for his intricate and elegant knives like the Typhoon, the Evo, the Cyclone, and my absolute favorite, the Arch Nemesis. Welcome to the show, Brian. Thanks for having me. The Arch Nemesis, uh, you came out with it maybe, I don't know. It, it came onto my radar about a year and a half ago or so, a year ago. And to me, it is a, um, it's a perfect design. It's a, it's a perfect knife. So, okay, to me, that's my, my unobtainium. And uh, good friend, uh, knife friend Alex Tissot just got one from you uh-huh. with some radioactive inlay, um, uranium refira noble. And uh, I got to say, that, that knife blew me away. And anyway, it, that is a grail knife. I hesitate to use that term. But to me, 
that is a true grail knife as a dagger lover and everything else. So I just want to say, you did a fantastic job on designing that knife. Thanks, I appreciate that. You know, I took, I always take a lot of time in the design end of the knife. I typically don't, you know, draw a shape and then just make it fold. I mm -hmm. take a lot of time. If you've noticed, most of my knives, the blade fits inside the handle. To, to make a good ratio with the blade always fitting inside the handle is really tough. Um, you know, so I spend a lot of time with stuff like that, but the dagger, I loved everything about it. I love the symmetry from one side to the other. Um, there's nothing I don't like about a dagger. And what I tried to do is what it seems so many guys who do make a dagger go away from. They try to change the dagger to make it their own. And I understand that and why, but they a lot of them take everything that's sexy about it away. What to you is sexy about a dagger? Just the lines of it. No matter what direction you look at it from, it just you know it has that shape to like a woman's curves to it. I just you know something about it. I I just think it's sexy. Yeah, I think the I think the symmetry is unavoidably. I mean, it's it's undeniably appealing to me. I love double edged. Even if it's not a symmetrical dagger, I love the double edge. But when you add uh, that that perfect symmetry, there's something that is uh, you know. It's just intrinsically appealing, and uh, you mentioned blade-to-handle ratio, and that knife, I don't know, I've never held one, I've never seen one in person, I've only kind of uh, lusted after them third person in pictures, and it seems to have, I swear to God, the, the, the handle and the blade seem to be the same size. Yeah, obviously they can't be, you know, right. it's, it's, right. it's impossible, I wish, you know, I get it as close as possible, but... Um... Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of it, is making the blade look... E even if the blade isn't as big or as long, you try to do things to make it look beefier, bulkier, kind of, so it kind of evens out. When I say that, you know, adding the, the both flipper tabs mm -hmm. and and then cutting in with this, you know, with the choils there, just the little sharpening choils, trying to snick that area down so it then makes the other area look wider, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that, that's all... That all plays a part. So that's kind of like a, uh, almost like a visual trick or something. Right. Describe to me how you got to this point. I mean, you've, in my eyes, and these are, these are just my eyes, but to my eyes, you've designed a perfect knife, designed and created with your own hands, this perfect folding knife, but obviously you didn't start here. Describe to me your, your process in becoming a knife maker and getting to this point. This all came all of a sudden. It was about, well, now it's been about eight years. My wife met a neighbor. I don't know why I didn't go that night, but she went to a, she went to a neighbor's Halloween party, and I think I was I was probably back stuck with the kids at the time. You know, it was probably her chance to go out, so I was right. stuck. We had little kids at the time, you know. So she went out. She came back and she said, "Oh, this guy down the street, Bill, he hand forges his knives." I was like, "Oh, really?" Because I was working with machinery at the time. I worked for uh, a company that we made. I was actually in the R and D department. I designed and built prototype machinery hmm. so marketing would come and say build something for build something to make this and i would build a machine to make that so she met bill she said you got to go check this guy out i went and talked to him and said oh well let me show you what i can do with machines so i went back to my work you know i'm company time company money all that stuff you know and i set up and i i designed my first two knives and um yeah she was the same knife but i made two one for him one for me i machined the scale the, i machined the whole blade, machine the scales, all the all the components for it, made the sheets and everything, put it all together. I gave it to my buddy. He loved it, except he used it for digging when he metal detects. <laughs> Jeez. You know, my first two knives, I had a little sentimental thing going there, you know, and then uh, now not so much, but back then I was like, come on, man. <laughs> he doesn't hang, have it hanging in a prominent spot in his den no, no matter what he gets, he uses it. It could be, you know, if if all he has on him is a pistol and he needs a hammer, guess what he's using? That's just the way he is. So what was that first knife? What did that first knife look like? Um, that knife was a 7-inch um, long-bladed fixed blade. This was a fixed blade at the time. It was a Tanto because that's all I was able to do at that point because I didn't know enough about machining blades hard and all that you know that was my first just go at it i just said oh let me show you what i can do and ripped it up in a day 
Now, there was a lot of things that I didn't like about the knife net looking back, but it was still kind of cool some of the things I was able to do. And um, I kind of evolved the fixed blades for a while. You know, you know, nobody comes in and really goes, hey, I'm going to just start making folders really right off the bat. It's kind of tough. Not that nobody does, but it's tough. And he brought me, my, the guy Bill, he brought me to my first knife show, which was the New York Custom Knife Show. Hmm. And uh, walking around there, I had some dealers ask me about them, and I sold up, you know, sold a few things. And uh, I started going batshit there for a while. You know, I, but the, I was on my company time, my company machine. I was using my company machines to do all this. So after about two years of doing it, I finally made my first folder, and then too many people started knowing about it. So I said, you know what, I got to shut this down. I can't uh -huh. risk my job for it, you know. And what was nice, though, is everything is profit. When you're not paying for the, the time or the tools, <laughs> yeah. you know, I was buying the steel, but nothing else. Right. You know, uh, it, it wasn't as hokey as it seems. I, we pretty much bought that machine for one job, and I finished that job, and the machine sat there most of the time. You know, so I was able to kind of do whatever I wanted with it. It was over there doing its thing. I would program at night at home and set it up. So, sold a bunch of the fixed blades, um, stopped because of too many people knowing about it, and, you know, another year went by or so, then the company decided they're going to move to South Carolina. I didn't want to go down there at the time, so I uh, said farewell, came home, said to my wife, what are we going to do? She said, take that money that they gave you and go buy the machine that you want, and let's give it a go. I was like... All right, <laughs> you know, uh, I, now this is three kids, a house, you know, I mean, I was like, so that night I was literally looking for a machine. And uh, now at this time, I was expecting to still be getting unemployment. But I, in that few weeks, I opened up a business, you know, got the business name going, I did all this. And they said, well, you're not unemployed, you have a business. So I got zero unemployment. You know, I was expecting to get six months to a year, which would have kind of held me over until I had to design and really worked out the process. You know, everything I was doing was one at a time. When you, all of a sudden you go to make, you know, six parts at a time, it, it changes the way you do things. And uh, everything really changed. I didn't have, that was the hardest part of the whole process of everything was getting the process to make the <laughs> knives down. What do you have to do first and how I should do it? But, you know, I just uh, had to put my head down and, and go. So, well, you were it, in one stroke, totally lucky and totally on the spot. I mean, you're like, you, you have a wife who's supportive of your knife habit or, or of, of your knife making, which is pretty amazing. But at the same time, it's like, okay, got to gotta do it all now, like right off uh, right. the start. Yeah, I mean, so, and, you know, people, th a lot of people poo-poo the CNC guys, but, you know, we have to know a lot of skills too. It's just different skills, yeah. you know. So, I mean, to take a knife, now I'm trying to get a machine delivered to a house, you know, because I'm putting it in my garage. So that's a pain in the ass right off the bat because getting a forklift, or riggers and all that stuff, um, you know, so going to dealing with that, at the same time, I'm trying to design a knife that I'm going to go with first. I'm trying to figure out the process, design the fixtures, make the programs, do all that. And I don't even have the machine quite in yet. Mm. Now I'm trying also, you know, how much is all this going to cost me looking at software and computers and tooling and, and the works. Get the machine delivered. I look in the driveway and I go, holy crap, that thing's not going to fit. <laughs> it just looks so much bigger in the driveway. I still had, I knew I had to modify like my garage. I had to break off like the front of my house to get it in my garage. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, with a little modification of the house and the machine, I got it in there. And at that point, you know, I already had the, this, now I, once I had it in, I had the design, I had all that stuff going and I'm just, you know, starting to panic now, but I just put my head down. I go down, I, I get the first few made. And, um, you yeah, at that point I only had 35 Instagram followers, you know, hmm. five of them were my family. <laughs> so, you know, so nobody knew what, I, nobody even knew what I was doing. I got to January. This happened, like it started in October, just to give you a little bit of time there. By January, I said, you know what? I said, I can't, even though I'm going to keep trying to go with it, I'm going to have to take a job in the meantime and see what happens. So, you know, I got a job. I started February 17th. I know because that's my birthday. Hmm. 
set February 18th, I go to for my second day at the job and somebody on Instagram posted one of my pictures of my knives to somebody else and went to somebody else and somebody else. And within 24 hours, I had like a hundred orders. Wow. So, but uh, how did, so how did you settle on that first design? That was a little tough, you know, cause my plan, you know, at first, when I first got into this, I said, oh, I'm going to, with CNC, you don't really want to constantly change up what you're doing because it's so much back end work. So is that like programming? Programming. It's the design part, the programming part, the setting up the machine part for each for each part that you have to do. You have to go in and tell the machine where it is in space and set up all the tool heights and all that kind of stuff. Deal with okay. tolerancing and all that. So I said I wanted to come up with something that was a fairly simple design. I always like the thin, lean knife that fits in the pocket um i wanted the blade completely enclosed in the handle i wanted a nice flipper tab so it flipped easy you know so there was all these little attributes that i wanted to add to it and my idea was to make this simpler design and then show what i can do with all the cnc machining end of it you know when i came into this six eight years ago you would go to the tables. I mean, there was always those, you know, some crazy guys, but 99% of the tactical folders were just gray. And mm -hmm. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to come out and be a table of gray knives. I said, I'm just going to blend in. So I want to show f flashy stuff. I know it wasn't for everybody, but most people were able to appreciate it. So I came in and said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to keep that simple knife, but I'm going to show what I can do with the machining. And then I, you know, I tried a lot of different machining stuff and uh, I think it got a lot of, you know, people looking and it uh, seemed to work. I did well. The knife that really caught my eye first was the Cyclone. I'm a I'm a big uh, Bowie knife shape fan, and I love that double peak that that blade has. Uh, but the the exquisite kind of layered um, handle was what really uh, caught my attention. It was seemed like there were a couple of layers there, and they were kind of a uh, uh, had uh, different. Um, millings and slots, but all going at different angles, and it it really played a trick on the eye. I thought that was like really artistic. It's hard to to do some of that. You know, you think even with a simple frame, oh, all the things you can do to it, but to do it and make it look good is always a fine line. You know, there's, mm -hmm. it's just a fine line of looking, you know, like a knife you would get from a gas station. Well, yeah, but that, but that knife, obviously people, people who know, know that that's not a gas station knife, A and B. People who know, know that it takes an extraordinary amount of work, design, preparation, and just, well, an artistic eye to come up with that sort of multi-layer, uh, um, contra-angled, I don't know, what, whatever you call that, what it was. It was obviously, it seemed to me like you were showing off your chops there. Maybe you were coming, uh, that was what that was like your third or fourth knife? That was my second knife. Second knife. My second knife. Well, oh, he, actually, he... no. Actually, it was my third knife. The... The first knife I ever made was the one I was still working at that company. Oh. It was called the Viper. That's very boxy. Angular. And, and ang it's a yeah. tanto, right? Yeah. yeah. That's that's a beautiful knife, too. A lot of people like it. I don't know. It's like, uh, I don't know. I'm not fond of it. Either. Well, it's your it's your old, it's like any artist looks back at their earlier work and it's, you know, they see the value, but there's a little embarrassment or you wouldn't be an artist. You know what I'm saying? Right. I learned a lot from, from doing that knife, though. That's what actually brought me to my detent design. And so, you know, it started back that far. Tell me about your detent design. So my detent, I don't use a ball. I don't press, uh, drill a hole and press a ball in. I actually start with thicker, you know, I put an insert into my frames. So mine are all hardened lock, or hardened steel inserts. Mm -hmm. So I take my, I take thicker stock and I machine all that stock away to leave just a little nub that sticks up. And I, that's an engineered shape that I make. So that nub is actually what your detent is. It allows a couple things. One is, you know, when I was first making that first knife, I kept trying to get that ball in that perfect location. And that perfect location was always right at the edge or breaking through the edge. So every time I try to push a ball and get one close, I would crack the, you know, the steel or whatever. So that's what led me to how can I get past that? And I designed that into it. And, um, 
you know, it was a little different back then. At first, it was a, a nub with a chamfer all the way around it, and then I changed it as I went along to an actual engineered shape that has a ramp, so the blade slides up onto it and everything. You mean when you're closing it back up, it's a correct. It's in the okay. So, so you're you're saying that the detent. Uh, I'm not going to call it a ball, but the 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 detent nubbin or whatever you're calling it is actually a part of the leaf. It's it's all one piece. Correct. Wow. So uh, is that an especially is that a tenable design for um, a mass maker? Someone you know, a giant company. Is that something that you know, somebody who uses machinery? Yes. If you know, obviously, for a guy who's doing it in his home, or uh, you know, making them by hand, typically no. But it separated me from other people what they were doing. It cured a problem that I was trying to cure. It kept me unique, and not a lot of people were going to be able to copy it right away. Because I didn't say, you know, right in the beginning, I said, I'm not going to go try to patent this or anything. I didn't want to defend it. I'm, am I going to go after some guy in his garage who's making <laughs> knives? Like me, you know, making knives. Am I going to go try to screw with his living? No. I mean, even though he shouldn't be doing it like that, you know, I wouldn't go after somebody like that. Not for something like that, right. you know. So I did it, and it... uh it's on pretty. It's on every knife that I make now. People kind of demand and inspect it from from my stuff, even from my production stuff. Wow. Uh, we'll get we'll get to that in a second. But that's kind of like um, you know changing something that is. I mean, it it takes a little bit of audacity to change something that is um, tried and true in in a in a certain uh, area of manufacturing. The detent ball. Who questions that? You know. Uh, but you you saw a problem. A in the actual manufacturer, but also in the um, in the use of it, you know, in closing it and 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 in launching the blade, and uh, I mean that's an innovation that came out of necessity. Yep. And another advantage it has, for example, is you know if if you start getting blade play, you, you typically you would have to go drill that detent. You'd have to drill the blade, that detent hole, a little bit bigger so you get a nice sharp edge so it gets, goes in clean again and everything. This, you, you change the insert. I can throw away an insert and put in a new insert. It, it's um, because what happens, you know, if you design it right, you make, the, you make that less hard than the blade. So that wears, not the blade. And it's just an easy, an easy swap. I can even change the, the diameter of it or the angles on it to grab harder, come out easier. Well, in, in your time, have you had to do that? Have, has anyone ever sent back a knife to have, uh, you know, I've used this so many times that I've worn out this detent. Um, please put another one in. It's funny that you say because I have one on my table right now. But <laughs> I typically don't get knives back. I have now probably a couple thousand, you know, more than a couple thousand knives out there. Mm -hmm. And I get very few back. I've maybe had, I can count on one hand the amount of knives I've had back. You know, the one that I have now sitting on my bench is a, was the prototype. And Riot didn't get it quite right. It just had a little bit of rock. It's been through three people. Now this guy got it and then sent it to me to fix it. You know, so now I got to deal with that and figure out how I'm going to, you know. Now I got to basically draw and make a new insert because I'm not going to ask Riot to make them for me. Right. Well, so how has it been working with Riot? Tell me, tell me about the difference in process. I mean, you go down ordinarily, um, you know, you work in your own shop on your own machines, and and that's how it's been since the genesis of your career uh, in knife making. What's it like to? shift over to a different manufacturer or to a manufacturer altogether you know riot made it real easy but at the same time it's a little so it's weird because you know when i i take so much time and pride in my designs when i get a good design i'm saying oh man do i want to give this to a chinese manufacturer to make for me or do i want to make it myself you know and it's 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 getting harder and harder to come up with a unique design that doesn't infringe on other people's look, you know, part of it is also, I want, I'm trying to keep my own identity, my own look. And I think most people can see with all the knives I've made, most of them, you can look at it and tell that it's mine. Yeah. Um, so it's hard to keep that identity, but change it and not change it to what somebody else is doing, you know, cause I don't know many other guys knives. So, you know, I'll, I'll design a knife and I'll, 
I'll send it over to my buddies. Who's what does this look like? Does it look like anybody's out there? You know? And more times than not, it does. And that's not even due to uh undue influence on your part. It's not like you're scouring the the knife websites and looking at everything out there. It's just something in the zeitgeist that is coming out of you. Right. It's uh, as you're, you know, and I'm sure other guys do the same thing, as you're starting to play with shapes and how they fold together and ergonomics of the hand and it, things look like that for a reason. You know, the, the, the blade shape typically brings the, you know, brings the handle shape to a specific style. And that's, you know, you try to change that up as much as you can without getting that ratio all whacked out again and then making it, you know, so it's, it's a, it's always a, a battle to trying to keep that unique. So, uh, what have you done with Riot? I know you did the, the Evo, right? And then you got the micro Evo coming out. Is that right? I did. I started off with the, with the micro Typhoon. That was oh. a three inch version of my original Typhoon. I said, uh, I didn't really want to make a a knife that small myself. I'm into bigger knives myself. So As a like miser. To, yeah, I like to make the bigger stuff. Um, so I said, this is a perfect example and the price range, I can get it down to where it's a little bit better for these guys and it's more realistic with a tiny knife. So I, I gave it to them. They, I think they did very well at, at it. They, uh, I can't complain. Everything went smooth. You know, it's scary the first time sending off, you know, many thousands of dollars to China not knowing, you know, what to expect or, you know, am I ever going to see these people again? <laughs> yeah. You know, so, but, but they're very professional. I, um, I give them, you know, a, a nice drawing package. I give them two and 3d drawings and all that stuff. They typically nail everything. There's a cup on, there's a couple little details that they always seem to forget on the prototypes, but again, it's just the prototypes. They probably let that little stuff slide, like a little sharp edge here or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there's very few things. After I get the prototypes, there's very few things I have to change. So um, there's not a big back and forth, back and forth. Are they, are they trying to add things to your design? No. Now, it's funny that you say that because I know some guys who are getting these knives made, and yeah, it's... There's so much dialogue back and forth and, and pictures of the builds and blah, blah, blah. And has this good enough? And I don't have, I don't know. I don't have any of that. Um, I give them my drawings, tell them the materials I want to use, tell them the tolerances that I need on the certain areas, and they nail it. That's not altogether surprising because you're already uh, an experienced machinist. You're an experienced CAD uh, programmer and all that. It's like you could probably go over to their factory and after a day make knives in their factory, you know, it, 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 it seems more scalable. And, uh, so that, that's actually not surprising to me. You, you've got those skills. Yeah. I'm sure that helps a little bit, maybe. <laughs> so that was the, the first one was the, the, the mini typhoon. Then I went to last year I did on black Friday, I did the Evo typhoon. That was the 3.75 inch blade that did very well. People really seem to like that one. That came in three blade shapes, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, two different kinds of tantos yeah. and a... Two different tant... Um, yeah, two different tantos and the drop point. Right. So um, that did very well. I And if you've noticed, I typically do these just like I do my customs or did my customs. I do batches. So I'll say I'm going to make 100 of these or do 100 of these. Well, uh, there's minimum orders I have to make with them. But uh, yeah, I'm going to do 250 of these. and that And then I do them. And I move on to another design. I typically don't go back and revisit stuff, at least not yet. And which is funny because that's way different from what I originally came in here with. Remember, I told you I just wanted to design a simple shape right, knife, right, right. and then just I thought I'm going to be, you know, do be the next R.J. Martin, and you know, make the same knife for ten years right. and just keep being able to sell. I don't know how these guys do it. I mean, I know how R.J. does it. His knives are fantastic. Right. I don't know how. Some of these other guys are doing, you know, making the same knife for 10 years. And it's like, I don't, you know, so that was my plan. And then I realized, quickly realized, you know, if I can keep coming up with designs that are unique and still cool, you know, I can, I can keep selling the same people and new people. So, uh, it's worked out well so far. So I move, do a design and move on and then come up with something else. I mean, it pisses a lot of people off too, because what happens is all these videos and stuff come out after the fact, and then they go, well, why can't I get one? Well, the, here's the thing. If you have a fertile imagination as a creator of anything, and people either dig your designs or they don't, and they like your design language and whatnot, 
you know, it, you should be moving on from thing to thing and, and oh, almost looking back in shame at your old work. I mean, not really in shame, but you know what I mean? You move on to this next thing and then suddenly, uh, that has solved all these problems that the, that the first, that the others presented and you've solved right. that. But that new design creates new problems. You got to solve that. You got to keep moving forward. Yep. You know, I, 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 I understand that. I also understand the making the Sabenza for 30 years because it's just a beautiful, simple thing, you know. Do you think the, um, and this is a totally uh, self interested question, but do you think the uh, um, Arch Nemesis is going to go ever to a Riot or someone like that to be mass made? Yeah, a lot of people have asked me to do something like that. And, uh, it's just so perfect a knife. I hate to do that to it. You know, I think that's something I want to keep for myself mm -hmm. and just, you know, I'm trying to finish up the last few. I've been making it for two years now. Now, when I say I've been making it for two years, I made a lot of other knives in between. So I've, you know, I've made probably maybe 50 of them or so, maybe. But I finally said, this is it. I'm done. I'm going to finish up these last couple huh. and I want to move on to something different. But it's something that I think I want to come back to. But, you know. When I do come back, I want to come up with some new ideas, change it up a little bit, keep it the same, but change it up a little bit, make it more modern, or modern, or show some new techniques that I have. But I, I got to give it a break for a little bit, you know. Plus, there's only you know a pyramid of people who can afford you know stuff up to there. It's getting yeah. smaller and smaller the higher those prices go. So, right. fortunately, with Riot, you know that allows me to not have to do the 300 knives a year and i can just do the fancier stuff or try some new things you know it's allowing me to now i'm going to try some stuff that might not work out and i might be wasting some time but i can do that now you know i couldn't do that before it was just make knives and feed the family you know right right well i i think it's uh i mean to me having that having that one piece that's sort of like unobtainium is uh I don't know, it's kind of important for you uh, um, as a knife maker to have a little bit of, I mean, to folks like me, it's a little bit of mystique because, like, that is, uh, you know, someday, someday I'll get one by hook or by crook. But that's kind of nice, no, you know, having that as a as a knife collector, having that out there, knowing that, that, that someone's going to let go of one for some reason at some time, and maybe I'll be there. Or maybe just someday I get to hold one and appreciate one. I mean, you know. Yeah, no, that's that's a good part of it. I mean, you always want to to have the people uh, pining for one for sure. So you're in New Jersey. Yeah. Can you carry anything you make? I can't carry. You can't carry anything in New Jersey. <laughs> to, <laughs> oh my to, God, man. The only time the only time you can be carrying a knife is if you are hunting or fishing. Uh, got yep. nothing else to say about that except uh, you know. Tr Trust me, I'm trying to get out. <laughs> Doug Ritter's got his work cut out for him in New Jersey. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a tough place. It's uh, I'm at that point where, you know, my kids are one of my one of my kids is graduating high school and they're going to go to college. My um, other two kids are just going into high school next year. So uh, it was, do we leave now and let them start high school somewhere else? Do we stay at stay these four years? I think we're going to hold tight. Someday, I'll breathe some fresh air. Well, you do have to do what you have to do. Yeah. And 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 that'll that'll. So, what are your impressions of the knife world? I guess you you haven't always been a knife guy. I I hear this word knife community. I hear I hear that term knife community a lot. I I tend to use knife world because I like to uh, you know not pretend it's necessarily a community though. I have been so uh, impressed with people I've met since I've started this podcast. Not just people I've spoken to on the podcast, but people who have listened and reacted and have been interested in the people I've interviewed. What are your impressions of this industry? Uh, it's a lot of wackos. A lot of wackos. <laughs> <laughs> I get, you know, I get, I, it, it's some of the things that I get, you know, most of, 99% of the people are great. I like, I, all good, I can't say that. They're all good people. But I get so many people that just, you're grown men. You should have your act together a little bit better when it comes to, you know, for uh, this is a perfect example. So I send out my emails to everybody that says, I'm doing the pre-order for this on this day. Here you can go to this page and, and read about it. At the bottom of the page, it's where you click the link to the next page, which is going to be the order form. Mm -hmm. I got 50 emails. 
I can't see the next page. It's it's password blocked. It's like, guys, get your act together. Read. Nobody wants to problem is nobody wants to read anymore. If you read, you would know what's going on, but nobody wants to read. So I'll, in the title of my Instagram page, I'll write what it, it's about. I'll tell you the time, and I'll get six DMs. You know what time? No. Oh. It's just fr- I I am I'm so little on time in my life that all that stuff just frustrates me. You know, and I'm from New Jersey, so <laughs> you know, there's that. <laughs> well, maybe it's natural selection. Maybe maybe this is like Darwin's law, like playing out. It- you don't deserve a sharp by design knife if you can't read the freaking web page. There's there's not very many people I've you know no knife for you, but you know, <laughs> not for there, you, buddy. There's a, there, there, there's a couple. There, you know, I try to send them. To, I, I typically say, uh, you know, my knife's probably not for you. Who you want to go see? And I tell them some knife maker I don't like. <laughs> nice. Someone but who's very difficult on, to sick, work. Sick them on them. Yeah. Yeah. So. uh You've got the Knife Nuts podcast. You're a part of the Knife Nuts podcast. How has that changed your outlook? I've noticed it. Well, it's funny because now, you know, when I when I go somewhere, people come up, hey, and it seems like they know you, but you don't know them, you know, so it's a little awkward. That's they like know cool. everything about you, what you talk about, and I'm like, but I don't, I don't know you. It's just weird, you know, it's a little weird. But what it did do, it kind of desensitized everybody to me. So you eat... Typically in my life, you'd either like me or you hated me. It was uh, it was very polarizing. I know 50% of the people hate me. I'm fine with that. The other 50%, it kind of desensitized them a little bit. So now they're used to the way I am. You know, what are you going to do? Well, so so has it broadened your perspective on, I don't know, knives in general, the knife world, knife design, what's acceptable, what's not, what's desirable, what's not? I mean, to a certain extent, you're always trying to chase, you know, what are people looking for? What do they like? And, you know, you can't always make everybody happy. Mm. What I did find is, you know, try to do things that get the bulk of the people, though. You know, ultimately, yeah. this is how I eat. So I might want to do something. I might want to do the, you know, Riot dagger. But if it's going to hurt everything else, I can't, you know. So it's uh, it's hard sometimes but uh, to keep everybody happy and keep people from demanding certain things you know so something that is hard for me to um comprehend is that you're still i is this true you're still making those knives out of your garage yep okay i mean to me you look at them and they're uh, you know they're extremely refined it's it's uh it's it i can't imagine making anything like that in my basement i don't have a garage where i live so tell me a little bit describe your process i mean what's your day like luckily being I can make my own hours, I kind of chill in the morning. I get the guy, the kids off to school, say goodbye to everybody, have the coffee with my wife, and then it's like, then I come down to work. And I, when I come down to work, I come down here, you know, by that time it's probably 8.30, and, but work until, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night sometimes. There's, a, you know, I'm normally going up and down the stairs, keeping the machine going at, at the very least. Okay. But there's times I don't go upstairs until dinner time and, uh, don't eat all day, don't have a coffee, you know, just had that one coffee all day and just running back and forth. Because once I'm in the zone, I, I hate getting out of it. Cause, Can't uh, break it, yeah. I'm getting too old, too, you know. So once you get moving, it's I feel good. I go sit down for lunch, I'm done. Got to keep those go old in. bones warm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so when you're working on any, any, so right now you're working on Arch Nemesis and you say that uh, you, you, you've put out other knives in the in the meantime. But do you do you do all the screws at once, and then all the handles, and then all the like? How does that work? It depends for the knife. You know, in the early stages when I was doing, you know, two or three hundred of something, I'd break it up into like six month intervals. I'd say, how many can I get made in the six months, and then say, okay, well, I'm not going to make 150 blades. I'm going to make you know 75 blades, and I'd set up and I'd sit and machine 75 blades and depending on who was heat treating whether i was doing it or sending them out typically when i was getting that doing that many i would send them out Hmm. when i do smaller batches 20 25 i do myself and you know because you're that's the way you make money and it's not just making the money part of it is that's the way you know when i say by making money is if all them if all the parts are consistent you can put things together the way they're supposed to. If all of a sudden I'm trying to put a, you know, blades from one batch 
in with frames of another bat or trying to swap blades you know things don't always work out right so like with the insert with the detent i can once i get the first one dialed in then i can nail it on that whole batch if i all of a sudden start throwing things in the mix oh i got six pieces from this last run and i got two pieces from here mm. that's when things start to get a little more difficult you know so those you tend to go to the side until the end when you can have time to play around with them so you know i'll um the, the big stuff early on i did in big bigger batches now with the you know the arch nemesis and stuff i i pretty much do five at a time of something and all of them are kind of custom are, are you getting all orders like alex's you know do this and this and and put put this material in and i i pretty much tried to get away from that mm -hmm. because it's just so much of a time suck i mean it literally will triple the amount of time it takes to make a knife if i do it that way right. when and if i was a maker that was struggling to sell my knives i would probably have no choice but to just make what people wanted i'm fortunate enough where these i put them up on instagram two seconds later they're sold wow you know so so why add that complexity and all that time? I, I I mean, I know why. Guys are paying big dollars and they should get what they like. But at some point, I will make what you, you know, something that you like. If you'd let me do my thing. And things will change up, too. Because most guys, they don't really have much of an imagination when it comes to... they they. I want what the other guy had. Yeah. Or, you know, or, I want what the heck I had. Or whatever the steel of the day is, the steel of the hour. Make sure it's made of M390. Oh, and I have people that ask me for all whacked out steels and stuff. Oh, can you make it out of... The, you know, I kind of can do what I want then. You know, if I want to do a batch of different steel, then I do. You know, typically what I do when I do a knife is I'll do one steel for the bulk of the simpler versions and then i'll do dama steel or throw in some other stuff for the fancier versions but the the bulk of them i'll just say you know like the dark nemesis was nitro v that's what mm -hmm. all of them were if they weren't dama steel so so uh it occurs to me as we're talking there are it seems like and i, I can't actually point to any examples but it seems like there are people who make knives on machines cnc machines and try and take that part out of it. I look at your knives, and I've seen lots of real close-up pictures of them, and there's evidence of the fact that this is uh, um, milled out of, you know, with a machine. But for some reason, even, even the way the B and the N come together, the, the machine-ness is in there. It's kind of like seeing a brush stroke on a painting, you know? And, and to me, that adds to the appeal it's not something i want you to hide that's not something i would want to be taken away like uh really there's a masterful touch in how the machine is is put to that material and i think that's pretty cool yeah that's part of the art of what i do i that's not something i'm going to try to hide you know and say oh they're handmade you know i mean there's a lot of handwork that goes into them there's nothing that comes off the machine done right you know so you know especially the, the Typhoon, for example, for the first two years of making knives, I hand sanded all the mill marks out of, you know, 750, I think it was 750 typho Typhoons. Maybe 90% of them were hand rubbed. That's wow. why my shoulders and neck are so bad. <laughs> just, are you talking about just the blade or, or the whole? Just, that's, that's just the blades. Oh, yeah. my God. Oh, because, because there's a little pattern that comes out. Well, those, the way I was doing, you know, you can 3D a blade, so you can take a ball end mill and you could, you know, follow that surface and keep milling back and forth to reveal that, that bevel. Mm -hmm. Or you can hold the blades up on their side or on an angle, if there's a lot of different ways to do it, and then use the side of the end mill to cut. Oh. So in the beginning, you know, I want to keep that cycle time down. When you're making 700, or I mean, when you're making 300, you can't. 3d mill them because it takes too long you know it takes hours or it could take an hour per side easy right you know it, sometimes there's some blades like if you look at the the dagger blade that i did with all the little um that carbon wrap like the um the weave yes i know exactly you know, which one yeah. i had a machine that blade to smooth first and the smoother you make something the longer it takes you know because you want that to keep the smoother you do it the finer that step over has to be right right and, and when i say it can double you know it can change time for example if i did a, 
a 25,000 step over on a blade that's six inches long and every 20 so that's every 25,000 that end mill is coming down and following the shape of that bevel it now if I say I'm gonna go you know 12 and a half thousandths I'm gonna do it it's gonna take twice as much time now Wow you know and there's some blades that I go down to you know like when I'm gonna machine those pattern in you need a really fine surface so I it might have taken me two hours to machine just the surface smooth before I even went back to do the three hours of with that little 16th ball mill going back and forth you know so it's uh but that's part of what I do and I wouldn't hide that stuff or or lie about that you know it's not worth it's it, it's what I do you don't like it then don't buy them well yeah you know? it's not it's not even a matter of hiding hiding or lying it's it's a matter of that's part of what makes these things beautiful. I agree. So, uh, all right. So, what's in the future for you in terms of design? What what's what's your what are the next couple of knives in the offing going to look like? Do you have any idea? Well, considering I'm stopping this one, I should really know by now. <laughs> I should I should have known about wait, wait, four months ago. <laughs> wait, what's the you have the little knife with the cutout, and I forgot to I I can't, I can't remember the name of it, but the, the little void. Yeah, the void. Yeah, that's a 3.25 inch blade, um, which oddly, when you hold it in hand, it seems a little bit bigger than that. So that's going to be a Riot knife. Okay. I did I did the pre-orders for that a couple months back. They're going to be delivered the end of December, first week in January. I didn't want to do it again right away, but I had a lot of people asking for the Micro Evo. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be my second Riot run this year. Wow. So I'm going to be probably not doing that again for a little bit you know i don't want to over you know yeah overdo it yeah you don't want to saturate the market right but again because i change the knives all the time i really don't you know yeah. part of and part of the reason i do that is for them the collectors you know if if they can't if people can't get them again it keeps that value up that that at least that that's the best way that i can really think of to keep that value up at the moment you know so you're you're unsure of what your next uh whatever the build you're going to be doing is i have a couple different designs going unfortunately yes so yesterday i said i'm going to sit down all day and and start whacking away at designs because it's getting like i said it's getting it's getting to that point where I should have I should have fixtures being made already. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, I should yeah. I should be doing all that, so there's no gap in between. But um, you know, so I sat and designed, and once I get in design mode, things start going and things start flowing, and I got this knife just the way I liked it. Almost, I was dealing with some of the little little details. Crash, lost the whole thing. Oh, for like, th like three hours oh, worth of work. God. I sh I should have been saving during all of that, but again, I get in the zone and I forget, and I just start going, and I had a, you know, I had a crash and lost it all, and I so I sat there for another three hours and tried to get it back to the way it was, and I just can't get it. Damn, I just I just can't get the lines like they were. We're not in charge, Brian. We're not yeah, in charge. I guess not. <laughs> Damn. Well, you know what? Uh, I always find that when when I have to do something twice. I'm also in a creative field. When I have to do something twice, it's usually better the second time anyway. It'll get distilled out. I'm hoping, but it's, uh, yeah, I got to I gotta put my head to it a little bit more. So, Brian, where do people find you? Where do they find your knives? Where do they buy your knives? What's the best way to, and I, I'm not saying send emails to, to, to Brian Nadeau. I'm just saying, like, what's, <laughs> what's anyway. the best way to find your stuff? Typically, Instagram is where you're going to see the most current stuff. I look at that all the time. I try to get back to people right away. I try to get back to people with emails and everything right away. Um, only because I get so many, it's a burden if you just wait till the end of the day even. Yeah. You know, so the best way for me to handle that is just hammer them out as soon as I can. Um, Instagram is the best way, though, uh, to see what I'm doing, to see what I'm putting up for sale. A lot of times when you see me put something up, a lot of times they're available. It's uh, the person who says, you know, sends me a DM right away. A lot of times they'll get it. That's the best place. Um, what doesn't go right away on Instagram will go to my website, but they rarely get there. I, so once in a while, I'll throw them on there. On, I'll throw them on my website just to keep some of the guys that are looking every day. Yeah. Because you know, I see the same uh, addresses every day, you know, so I, I throw one up once in a while. Well, I've I've been on your website recently, and I and I've been going to the uh, available knives page, and so yes. I'm like, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> these daggers. Go, sorry, you know, like I said, it. I I show, and it's it's funny because I don't really, I put I post stuff as much for me as I do everybody else. You know, when I 
I need to I need to hear feedback to keep going and hear good things and hopefully not bad things, you know. Mm -hmm. So when I finish up a knife and you when you see a knife show up on Instagram, I literally just finish that. You know, it might be warm from from the mill and still. You know, that's <laughs> that's how quick I put. On, you know, when I'm ready, I take that. When it's done, I take that picture to get to keep me motivated to go to the next one now. You know, so but a lot of times those knives are available. You just gotta, you know, ask. Well, you heard it from the man himself. Be tenacious. Keep after his uh, Instagram page and uh, watch for knives hot off the presses, uh, or I should say hot off the mill. Brian, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast. It's been a pleasure meeting and speaking with you. You too, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Take care. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. And we're back on the Knife Junkie podcast, episode number 66 of our show that has been going on for a little over a year now, and we're glad that you are on the journey with us. Uh, if you're a new listener, we thank you so much, and we would like to ask you a favor. Please leave us a rating or review. Be honest. You know, we'd love it if it was five stars, but, you know, give us some feedback. Let us know what you like, what you don't like. Whatever uh, podcast player app you're listening on has a rating system, so please leave us a rating or review. Bob, another great interview. As as I said, what was your uh, what was your thoughts coming away from uh, that? Something something that is amazing to me uh, about what I've found out about Brian, and I found that, this out about a few other people. You know, not really a knife guy going into it, but man has a, had a real latent talent. I mean, not just in um, you know, obviously he was a a uh, an accomplished machinist by the time he started making knives, but just by looking at the designs, the intricacies, the, the lines, uh, the the symmetry, just the beauty of his work, it seems like he was always a knife guy, just didn't know it. He had that, he has that latent talent for uh, designing knives. Well, not so latent anymore. He's now just like burning right. stuff up with it. But uh, like I said at the outset, that that arch nemesis to me is is uh, you know a perfection and. Uh, Maybe one of these days I'll get my hand on Alex's with that uh, uranium Refera Noble in it. But, uh, yeah, so Brian Nado, just another, uh, not just another guy, a guy who, who takes the, the bull by the horns and uh, takes on a knife career and just, to me, is, is redefining things. Well, and I think he uh, mentioned some of the places you can find him online. It was uh, sharpbydesign.com. That's the uh, website. He's also on Instagram at sharpbydesign. So, uh, as we're wrapping up this podcast, as you as we finish up, you can go check him out at Sharp by Design and on Instagram at Sharp by Design. And it, it, he doesn't he also uh, do a podcast oh my gosh, as well? Yeah, he's on the Knife Nuts, which is uh, the preeminent knife podcast, uh, um, much loved by many. And uh, yeah, that's where I first got to to know him. Um, you know, I I failed to mention this too. He's just a, a cool guy. He was fun to talk to, and uh, you know, real relatable. And yet he's making these, uh, what I estimate as, uh, you know, almost knife art. Almost meaning I, if I had one, I wouldn't feel too bad about actually using it. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this interview with Brian. Uh, give us a call on the listener line at 724-466-4487, 724-466-4487, or shoot Bob an email at bob at com and let us know your thoughts or uh, comments, reactions to this interview with Brian. And uh, we'd love to hear from you. Bob, a uh, final uh, thought as we wrap up. I would have to say, kind of like uh, what Brian said, use the resources you have uh, at hand at the moment to do as much as you can to get you towards that goal. All right. Very good. Very well said by the Knife Junkie and Brian Addo on episode number 66 of the Knife Junkie podcast. We'll talk to you on Wednesday with our supplemental. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Point, point.